Howdy, welcome to Computer Graphics, Animation and Simulation. Today, we're going to talk about collisions. So, today we're going to talk about three things. First of all, collision detection, which is whether a collision happened or not. Secondly, determination, for finding out exactly where and when it happened. And finally, the response. So what's the resulting effect? What do we do about it? So let's start with collision detection. This has to do with whether or not an object passes through a boundary. Let's take a look at an illustration. So we have here a vertical axis and a boundary. And let's just say that we're simulating a ball dropping. So in this particular case, it's pretty easy to decide when a collision happened. We simply just check the y values. So we might say this is the y value at time step 1, time step 2, time step 3, time step 4, time step 5. And as long as whatever value of, of y is greater than our value for b, which is our boundary, then we're okay. But as soon as we change over to the other side, then we know that we have a collision. So collision essentially is just determining when we've crossed the boundary. Now, let's say that we are want to go past a 1D example, and maybe we want to look at a plane uh, like this one. And let's just say that we have a, a point, and we want to find out which side of the plane that we're on. So we might, well, we can do that by using the plane equation. So we have the direction of the plane, and this is given by a normal with three components, an x and y and z and if you're familiar with the plane equation which is ax plus by <laughs> plus cz plus d equals zero then the the key is just knowing that uh, a, B, and C represent the normal, and what we can do is change this equation uh, so that we could say that our point X here is about a certain distance D from the plane, and then we have a point P that we know that is on the plane so we can change the plane equation so that we have uh, nx times x plus ny times y plus nz times z minus our uh, normal vector the <coughs> A dot product with this point P on the plane. Okay, so uh, effectively what we can do is use the sign of our uh, of, of the result of this equation. So if we have a point X and we plug it in here, then this is almost the same thing as saying that uh, the distance is equal to if we just simply subtract our point, you notice we have this vector here. So we can say our point x minus our point p dot product with the normal. And you will notice that because this is the dot product of our point x with n. So we're just simplifying it over here. And this allows us to determine the distance, and this is the signed distance, of the point x from the plane. Now we can note here uh, 
that we can also uh, use spheres or circles instead of just points. And that's by considering an example where we just use uh, the radius. So uh, here's a, a quick sample. So we'll just erase this real quick. And we'll just draw our, our boundary here. And then we might have our object. So I'm going to draw a circle. And this has a radius of r. And so we can just uh, know that we also have a distance r over here. Uh, so then what we can say is modify our equation so that now we have the distance is given by the center of the circle or the ball minus the point on the plane dot product with the normal of the plane plus our distance r. And so this will allow us to easily extend our uh, collision detection, not just between points and planes, but also between circles or spheres and planes. So now let's find out how do we determine where the collision happened. For first of all, we have a simulation loop that we're trying to execute. And inside the simulation loop, we're uh, going through a number of time steps. And so the first part is we're determining accelerations. And then we're going and doing an integration step. So we're looking at our new time step. And so now we want to determine our collisions. So we do our detection. And this is the spot where we need to determine where the collision happened. So if we happen to detect a collision, then we need to go ahead and find out exactly where it happened. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll just, we'll go ahead and just use smaller time steps until eventually we can determine where it is. And so we'll go ahead and determine collision. And we'll go ahead and do the integration again. And we'll calculate a new, we'll call it S new. And then we'll do the response. Which we will talk about next. Simply, all we're doing is just finding out exactly where the collision happened. So if we had the example of our ball, and <coughs> let's just say that uh, this was our boundary then this just simply means that we're going to go ahead and make it so that we don't violate that boundary. And we'll just move it back up where it needs to go and adjust the, the position. And then we go ahead and do the response. Uh, another way of looking at this is maybe just simply to plot the the intersection, so we'll just take a quick look at that. And so maybe we have that this is our new X, and this was our old X. Then what we would want to do is find out exactly where the new X should have been. And so we'll calculate our, our new X position based on the determination. So let's go ahead and talk about the collision response now. So we do the collision response once we've determined the time and location of the collision. And we want to treat this as an instantaneous change in the state of our particle or object. Now, <coughs> we're trying to keep it simple right now because when you're implementing these kinds of algorithms, you want to use a, a you don't want to get too complicated. Um, but there are a couple of factors that we need to uh, be concerned about. So 
here are those items. So elasticity uh, has to refer to the uh, bounce uh, of the object, okay? And then friction is going to be uh, the other uh, factor to consider uh, for our collision response. And this is going to um, uh, deal with when objects are rubbing against each other. So when we're talking about elasticity, we might have uh, two kinds of uh, situations. So we have what's called uh, an elastic bounce and inelastic. Uh, so when you think of inelastic, we might think of uh, billiard balls. In other words, uh, what happens is that when one ball hits the other, so we're going, what ends up happening is at the collision, all the energy is transferred from ball number one to ball number two. And at that point, ball number one stays still, ball number two goes uh, in the next direction. Now, this has to do this is mainly determined by the mass of the object. So if the mass is not the same, then what will end up happening is that some of the energy will be transferred in different proportions to both objects. This is why uh, when you drop a ball onto the Earth, technically the Earth moves, but it doesn't move by very much because it's so big. And so what ends up happening is the collision uh, ends up sending most of the energy back to the original object. And so uh, when you're talking about um, elasticity, sometimes you might use this idea of a, a coefficient of restitution, or C sub R. <laughs> and these are going to have different values. Uh, we might say that... Uh, values of zero essentially mean that um, it's highly inelastic. And the way we might look at this, think about this mathematically, is that the new velocity is equal to the coefficient of restitution times our uh, previous velocity. Now, one way to describe this um, or notation-wise, how we can do this is to say that uh, this is after the event. So we use a, a plus sign, and we'll say that this is the velocity before the event. So we use the minus sign. And secondly, we also have to think about the direction of the velocity. In this case, we're interested in the normal uh, direction. In other words, if we have our plane, this is the direction of the normal. So this is the velocity that's going back up. So if we were going down, this was our previous velocity, then we are interested in what is our velocity going back up. And how much that we lose, so let's just say that this is the amount that's lost has to do with the coefficient of restitution. Now, it should make sense that the coefficient of restitution should never be less than zero. That's like taking energy out of, uh, <clears throat> out of the whole system, and that breaks the law of conservation of energy. So you can't destroy energy, you can't create energy, and so... Uh, Values below zero is unrealistic, and values above one uh, is like adding energy to the system, and that doesn't work as well. So uh, realistic values would be, say you have a baseball hitting a wood surface, uh, you might have a value of about 0.5, and maybe you drop a tennis ball on a court, that might have a coefficient uh, of 0 0.73 to 7.76, and then a basketball might uh, be 0 0.82 to 0 0.88.
okay? And a basketball, we, we would consider to have a pretty high restitution. So uh, now let's talk about friction, okay? So when we're talking about friction, a lot of times what we're doing is we're talking about uh, tangential velocity, okay? So normal velocity is going uh, with the normal, tangential velocity is going uh, to the side. So we might say this is the tangent, tangential direction. So we will have that a new coefficient, uh, which we'll call CF, and this is also a number going from 0 to 1, and we'll call that the fraction of uh, tangential speed lost due to the collision. And so we'll say that our tangential velocity afterwards is equal to 1 minus our coefficient of friction times our tangential velocity before. Now, at this point, we need to uh, look at the fact that we're talking about velocity in terms of these two directions, but we haven't said how to get those directions, okay? Because after all, we only know one thing, which is our velocity. So let's figure out what that looks like. Okay, so we have our tangential velocity before, and then we have our tangential velocity afterwards. And so we are going to say that our tangential velocity equals 1 minus our coefficient of friction times our initial velocity minus the velocity due to the direction of the normal. And in order to determine the direction to the normal, we are going to go use a projection, which we will say that our normal direction is given by, <coughs> oh, sorry, our coefficient of restitution, so our velocity before, dot product with the normal, times the direction of the normal. So this is how we get the normal velocity and then this is how we get the tangential velocity. We just simply subtract the normal velocity from our original velocity. <coughs> and that's how we get these two numbers. Now in physics, uh, sometimes we don't use the, these coefficients. This is actually a simplified model and it makes sense for practicing, uh, practicing uh, doing collisions uh, with computer graphics. Uh, but what we will say is that there's the Coulomb model of friction. And I might be saying that wrong. And the, the Coulomb model of friction uh, is given, uh, if you're talking about, we have two kinds. Uh, first, we have static friction. And then we have kinetic friction. And for now, we're just going to focus on the Uh, we're going to focus on the, the static model uh, because this is what happens when two surfaces are uh, up against each other. And uh, kinetic friction has to do when they're slipping between the two surfaces. So we're not going to talk about slipping right now we're, <coughs> uh, because uh, we're dealing with uh, uh, spheres. But we're just going to work with the static friction for right now. Uh, I will note that when you have the kinetic friction, though, the, the values of uh, mu k is typically uh, less than mu s. In other words, it, once you start slipping, it's easier for them to keep slipping. Okay? And uh, in terms of what we're talking about, um, 
these these values of friction uh, we might have say Teflon versus Teflon you might have values of 0 0.05 if you have wood on wood then you have values of 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 if you have steel you might have a mu value of 0 0.5 and 0 0.8 and it's kind of interesting that if you have some metals like silver and silver it'll actually have a mu value greater than one so I find that interesting uh, but when we're talking about applying Coulomb's uh, friction then uh, we will use a slightly different equation. Uh, we will say that the tangential velocity, so after, is equal to the tangential velocity before minus the minimum of either mu times the magnitude of our normal velocity or our tangential velocity times the direction of our tangential velocity before and you'll notice we had just we just put the hat on top of the tangential velocity meaning that that's a normal vector so we're just we want to keep the same direction but we want to use the the smaller of either the um, the friction times the normal velocity or whatever our uh, tangential velocity was beforehand. And what this makes sure is that the tangential velocity does not get reversed, but set to zero if the friction is high enough. So this will make our uh, animations a little bit more realistic, and but uh, it's possible that we may choose to use the simpler model of just using the coefficient of restitution or friction and because it's simpler to implement. So to wrap up, um, that's how you would deal with the response of the collision. In other words, we want to adjust the velocity. And <coughs> uh, we adjust the velocity uh, based on where we determine that the collision happened, which you remember, we just simply, once we detected a collision, we, we go ahead and find out exactly the spot where it happened. And we adjust this so the object is at the boundary, and then we um, and in order to do that, we went ahead and uh, applied uh, the plane equation to calculate what side of a plane that we are on with a point, and we could extend this with a radius r. And uh, so that's essentially just about it. So um, we'll call this the review. And as always, I'd like to go ahead and just uh, say uh, thank you and adios.